Ooh, good morning. I'm all tangled up. Hey, uh, so any of you guys like to go to the skating rink? Yeah. Okay, I got a few. So we, we were at the skating rink the other day, and you know, afterwards, how they've got the skate races and then got the foot races. And Josiah, our three year old, wanted to do the foot races. And so they call the ages, four and five year olds, up to the line. I'm like, you got this, bud. He's three. And so he goes up. And uh, I, I, I kind of show him the line. I'm like, look, follow this blue line around the circle, and it's going to be fun. He wanted to race. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so, you know, he counts it off when your market set, go. He starts off a little slow, but he catches up pretty well to this turn, and he, and he kind of forgets to turn. And so he swings out wide, and, and he gets past, and he just keeps going, and then he starts to cry, like bawling uncontrollably. And he runs straight to me, and I pick him up, and I mean, just bawling and bawling. I'm like, son, what? what is it? What happened? You know, we get him over. I'm trying to calm him down. He's like, I wasn't fast enough. He got past. I was like, oh man. One, he gets his competitiveness from me and his mom. We're both very competitive people. Um, and two, it's like, it's a good life lesson. You know, you're not always going to be the fastest. Number two, if you would have, you know, taken the turn right, you probably would have been ahead. But he's bawling. He's crying. He's crying. And he was so confident in his abilities as a three-year-old, like, hey, these other kids are going down. And, and when he failed, he is bursting into tears. And a lot of times, as it relates to life, you know, we're kind of the same way. We put our confidence in different things. And when we fail, we end up bawling uncontrollably and running to someone to hold us and make us feel better because we don't like to fail. And failure is all the worse when you're confident that you're not going to fail, right? I mean, if you go into something like, okay, I'm going to lose, that's pretty easy. But when you approach life with this, there's no way I'm going to be a failure. I'm going to succeed and we fail. You know, life is kind of bad. And that's kind of what we're talking about this morning. What exactly do we place our confidence in as it relates to to life and as it relates to our spiritual lives because maybe you're you're in here and you're kind of like me you know you're you're a mom or a dad and you're confident that you're going to you're you're going to succeed and then you you know you see super mom or super dad's Instagram and they they pass you with ease and you're like I'm such a failure I mean like what do we do with that in life and this morning we're going to talk about how we're supposed to place our confidence in the thing that really matters as it relates to life, but more importantly, as it relates to our spiritual lives. So we're going to continue on with this conversation. We started a few months ago called This is Living, where we're going through the book of Philippians, this beautiful letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to this church that he planted. God used him to plant this church about 10 years prior to this letter. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians 3. Last week, before we read, just to kind of catch us up, um, Paul is writing to them to be on guard for these folks that are the Judaizers, and they're adding things to the gospel. You, if you really want to get close to God, it's Jesus plus some other things. And, and then so from that kind of idea, he proceeds in Philippians 3, verse 4. And before I read, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, we thank you for who you are, what you've done. We thank you for your word. We ask that in this moment you would speak to us, to our minds, to our hearts, that you would, in this moment, continue to transform us into the likeness of your son, that we would better love you, better love our neighbor, that you would give us a big, a, a greater vision for what it looks like to live well. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So verse 4, again, actually, let's just start with verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Remember, the same things are the safe things. And look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised 
on the eighth day. Remember, part of the sign uh, for God's people as the Jewish folks is they're circumcised. The males are circumcised on the eighth day. And so this is almost kind of like a little take that, you folks, that are putting confidence in the flesh. They're coming in to the fold late, becoming circumcised as an adult. Again, adding things to the gospel. And Paul's saying, look, I'm the real deal, like legit. If anyone can put confidence in this, if this gains any value, I've got it. I was circumcised on the eighth day, a a true sign that I belong to God's people. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. This is not just any tribe that Paul belongs to. He's one of two that actually remained somewhat faithful to God. Benjamin and Judah were the most faithful. So look, I'm not one of those, the the tribes that they started worshiping other gods really early. I am the real deal. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee. Now Pharisees were teachers of the law. In fact, they did more than just teach the law. So if If God's word said it's a sin to touch this table, the Pharisees are going to come along and say, actually, to help people definitely not sin, let's make it a rule that now it's a sin if you just get within a foot of the table. And so they're they're keepers of the law. They're teachers of the law. And, And this is Paul. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, before his conversion, before he comes to know and love Jesus. He's so religious. He is fervently so for the things of God that he understands that this whole Jesus talk is going to tear down his religious system that he holds dear. And he's zealous to eradicate it from the face of the earth. He's a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, he says, I'm blameless. Verse 7. But whatever gain I had... I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. So this is a long passage, especially to try to cover on a Sunday morning, but we're going to do our best. And I think the first thing that Paul kind of uh, comes across, and it's pretty much true for all of us, is this, that most of us are tempted to trust in rituals, tradition, and zeal. You know, before Jesus, this encounter with Jesus, Paul had put his confidence in traditions, uh, rituals, and zeal. And if you think about it, maybe especially as we talk about confidence in our spiritual lives. Maybe you've never been tempted to put confidence in being a good Jew or following the law or belonging to a certain tribe. But you know, this is Alabama, the Bible Belt. We're the most religious state in our country. I tied with Mississippi the last time I checked for number one. And so maybe your tradition is, look, I've grown up in church, got it made, I'm there. Or maybe it's, you know, I, not only do I, I go to church or I've gone to church for a long time, but I actually serve in church. Or maybe you're the most spiritual person in this room and you're like, not only do I go to church and serve in church, but I volunteer in the nursery. Or I volunteer with trailblazers, those K through 6th graders on Sunday mornings. Because let's face it, if anything should merit righteousness, it's those two things before God. And, and we're tempted to put all of our confidence in doing these things. And, so, and here's the problem. When we do that, and then we build our confidence from doing good things, and then we try to uh, base who we are as a spouse or a parent or an employee or an employer on those things, on being a good person and doing good things, and we fail... 
it's like we can't run fast enough to be of any value and we start crying and we break down just like our three-year-old. You see, because none of us are really good enough and do enough things to merit genuine confidence even from being good people and doing good things. And let's face it, those are good things. Those are really good things. Volunteering in the nursery is an awesome thing. And as Tony mentioned, we need more help doing that at the 945 hour. So please sign up. And if you're already on the rotation for all day on Sundays, and if you want to do a little more, hey, that's fine too. We got too many babies. That's a good problem to have though, right? Too many babies. Um, But our confidence cannot be found in doing those things. It just can't. Because we will fail every time. None of us are good enough. And I guess before we go on any further, we, we kind of need to define what righteousness is. Um, and so righteousness is properly understood as this kind of judicial approval, as Paul's talking about in this, um, having no righteousness of his own. And when we talk about judicial approval, it's this, we, we can stand confidently before God as this, I am worthy to merit something good before God. And so the temptation, even for Paul and his counterparts, is this idea of, I do these good things, I belong to this tribe or this clan, or I'm so zealous for these things that I now merit right standing before God. And Paul says that's not really the truth. And even we kind of live in a culture today, as Paul says, he was zealous for the things of God. Um, We kind of hear that it really doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere in that belief. Because really, we can't know a whole lot about God, but somehow we can know that he, he's loving. And so those people that are just really sincere in their belief, and it doesn't matter what that is, whether it's a belief in Jesus or Islam or Buddhist, uh, if they're sincere, God has mercy on them. And, you know, these kind of teachings are going on. And Paul's like, no, being zealous for anything does not merit right standing before God. Because some of us, we are passionate even about good causes, right? We're passionate about life. We're passionate about adoption. We're passionate about caring for the poor. But even being passionate about really good things cannot grant us true and genuine confidence in life. It just can't. Now again, those are all good things. Serving in the church is a good thing. But our confidence can't come from those things. We will fail and cry every time. And here's what Paul says in verse 8. I love, I love this verse. I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. You know, true confidence comes from knowing Jesus. That's where true confidence comes from knowing Jesus. I love what Paul says. For his sake, for Jesus' sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And now this would have been a somewhat crass statement to Paul's hearers. Um, The word means more of like excrement. Um, So so if we were going to say it nicely in church, look, all these other things that I placed my confidence in, they're crap compared to knowing Jesus. And and I love, actually, the King James Version, if you use that Bible, it says dung, which is just a fun word to say anyway. But all things are dung. It's crap compared to knowing Jesus. Because, you see, true confidence comes from knowing Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. Because when I'm confident in the person that Jesus is, who is the perfect man, right? And so when my confidence is, is found in a relationship with him, then when I fail as a parent, I don't have to run and cry and scream. Or when I fail as a spouse, or when I, when I lose my temper at my job, or when I'm a bad employer, or when I'm about whatever. You see... What we're talking about this morning is very theological, but it also has a lot of applications for our everyday life and how we respond 
to our shortcomings in every area of just living. I mean, this whole series, we're talking about what does it look like to live well. I mean, that's what we all want, right? I mean, most of us. I mean, even people that don't know Jesus want to live well. Like, we want to know what it's like to be satisfied. We want to be fulfilled. We want to be good parents. We want to be good spouses. And when we put all of our confidence in these things and ourselves, we're going to fall short every time. But when our confidence comes from knowing the one and true perfect man who is God himself, you see, everything changes. Everything changes. And as we talk about righteousness, though, there is a dilemma that Paul's kind of talking about in this passage, and it's this, that only righteous people can go to heaven, and yet no one is righteous. Only righteous people can go to heaven, and no one is righteous. So how are we supposed to do this? How can I actually know God? How can I actually know Jesus? And what Paul says is that he may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of his own, which comes from doing good things, but that which comes through faith in Jesus. Verse 9. It's through faith in Jesus. And see, there's a theological concept It's called imputed righteousness. And here's all that means. That when somebody places their faith in Jesus, and so then you could ask, okay, what does that look like? Maybe you're in here this morning, you're like, I have no idea what you're even talking about. Uh, So I believe in God. Does that mean I'm good? And so placing your faith in Jesus is not necessarily believing in God or believing in Jesus. It's believing God or believing Jesus. It's believing that what he says in his word is true for you. And so when I when I put my faith in Jesus and I take him at his word and I read that he died for my sins, I believe that is true for me. And see, when you do that, Jesus imputes his righteousness. So Jesus, the man, right, lived a perfect life that no one else could live. He's the only one that could do it. And when we place our faith in him, he actually gives us his righteousness. Now that does not mean that you will be perfect, that you'll ever be perfect before Jesus comes back and he deals with sin completely. But what that means is now you have right standing before God that when God the Father looks on you, He sees his son, even though he might be looking at a big fat failure, which is what he should see when he sees me, and what he should see when he sees you. But for those of us that have placed our faith in Jesus, he sees the righteousness of his son, and see, we have confidence in this. So instead of starting out at the bottom of the mountain, trying to get to where I want to be, And so in order to have confidence in life, I've got to be a perfect spouse. I've got to be a perfect parent. I've got to be a perfect employee or employer. Or I've got to do life so well that maybe through my struggles and toils, I'll end up on the top of the mountain where I want to be. You see, when we put our faith in Jesus and he imputes his righteousness in us, he pulls us from the bottom of the mountain and he himself sets us on top. And so we have a new standing in life. We have a new place where we view life completely differently because of how God sees us. And so I'm free to love God. But guess what? I'm free to fail and ask forgiveness. I'm free to love my neighbor truly. I'm free not to be bound by all of these weights and chains of trying my hardest to do life well. Because now, you see, I've got the power of God living in me. And it's no longer me and my confidence that defines my life. It's Jesus and His. And that affects my, my perception of reality has changed forever more. And as we're talking about life, it's important to know this, as what Paul is saying. You know, the purpose of living is to know Jesus. That's the whole purpose of living. You want to live well, it's to know Jesus. How do you know Jesus? You, you take Him at His word. That's what Paul says. He wants to know him more. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as crap in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him 
and the power of his resurrection. You know, a lot of times when we talk about how do you know Jesus, we add a lot. Well, if you really want to know Jesus, and again, it's with good things. If you really want to know Jesus, you've got to do this, or you've got to do this, or you've got to go here, you've got to hear this person speak, or you've got to listen to this music. If you really want to know Jesus, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to. Let me just read this again. Verse 9, Paul wants to be found in him, not having a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus, a righteousness from God that depends on faith. That, so that, I may know him. See, the purpose of living is knowing Jesus. And we know Jesus by, this is going to be super hard, I know it's going to be, really difficult to comprehend. To know Jesus is to believe Jesus. It's not a bunch of add-ons. It's not a bunch of... Now, there are, there are tools that help us as we see in God's Word, things like reading His Word and praying. You know, those are of great value. But I love the simplicity that Paul says, that when I believe Jesus, when I take him at his word, I know him and am found in him and my perception of reality is completely changed. And so now I can actually be successful as it relates to eternity and I can one day stand in the fullness of the presence of God and bask in his glory, but even now I can be confident in this life because I'm found in the one who is perfect and my confidence is no longer defined by my imperfections, but on his perfection. And Jesus defines every aspect of our life and we're found in him and we know him and we're caught up in the beauty of the gospel and that's how we live life. Well, it's a life defined by the gospel so that, Paul says, I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Most of us want to skip the next part probably and share in his sufferings. I want to know Jesus, but I don't want to share in his sufferings. I want that best life now life. I, want, I, want, I just want the good. Don't give me any of that bad stuff. And yet, Paul, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings. Man, that's a prayer all of us probably going to have to take to heart. What does it look like to actually share in the sufferings of Jesus? You know, because life isn't always easy. Life isn't, doesn't always go according to plan. Bad things happen. I mean, Paul in Corinthians, he boasts about his walk with the Lord, and he boasts about things like getting beat with rods and stoned and imprisoned and shipwrecked and being naked and knowing what it's like to be hungry. And hey, don't you want what I've got? This is how he boasts. I don't want that part of the Jesus thing. I don't know about you, but apparently that's part of it. You see... True life is about knowing Jesus and everything that that entails. And according to what Paul's saying, you've got the resurrection and the power of the dead and these really awesome, big, glorious things, but also with what comes with that are the sufferings. You see, the sufferings usually come first. Without the sufferings, Jesus never would have risen from the dead. You can't have the good, even in our spiritual walks with Jesus, without partaking in some bad. The suffering comes before resurrection. Paul says that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I don't know about you, I don't want that either. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And so that's this theological concept that when Jesus comes back, all people will be resurrected, good or bad. There'll be judgment as he sets up his his kingdom where sin is eradicated and all that kind of stuff. And, and we want to partake in that. And so the, the, the takeaway this morning is just that simple statement that life is really all about knowing Jesus. You could actually say that life, according to what Paul is saying, is really worthless 
apart from knowing Jesus. It doesn't lead anywhere. It's not fulfilling. It's not, it doesn't bring satisfaction. There's no point when those bad things do happen apart from knowing Jesus. But when I know him and am found in him, I can know what it means to be loved by the Father. And here's why this is important this morning. One, this is important because we will always, just like last week, we're always tempted to add something to the gospel. We're always tempted to place all, if not most, of our confidence in ourselves, in our abilities. And I struggle with this one. I do. I like to work. I like to succeed. I like to do things where I can say, yep, that was me. I did that. Done. I like that. And most guys are probably the same way. Most girls are probably the same way. But if my mentality and perception of life is, I'm a success when I succeed, most of the time I'm going to be a failure. Because even though I am a legend in my own mind, according to everyone else, I mean, you know what I'm saying? But when I place all of my confidence in Jesus, I mean, obviously for salvation, for being righteous, for when God sees me, he sees his son. You see, that impacts every aspect of my life. And so when I lose it and I yell at our sons, I'm not in that moment a failure at life. I'm in that moment have failed. You see, there's a difference, right? If my confidence is in, my, is in myself, then when I fail, I am a failure. But if my confidence is found in Jesus, when I fail, I just failed. And I go to my three-year-old and I'm go, hey, buddy, I'm really, really sorry. I should not have done that. Jesus did not like what your dad just did. But here's life. You know, we all mess up, even daddy sometimes. And that's why Jesus came for us and for you and for me, that we believe in him. And guess what? In God's sight, we're not screw-ups anymore. Isn't that really cool? Isn't that just a fun part of life, buddy, that, that God loves us that much? You see, where I place my confidence in all actuality affects how I handle every situation in life. And so the challenge this morning is easy. Take Jesus at his word. Don't compare your life as a parent or spouse or employee to the Instagram stories of those successes. You can't all be Mark Zuckerberg at your job place, right? You can't all be those dumb parents that seem to have everything right and their kids are perfect and you see them... I don't know what pills they're putting their kids on, but it's something. Because they ain't living life for real, right? Or you see, you hear those stories about that husband and, oh, guess what he did for Valentine's Day? And you're just like, shut up. <laughs> guess what I did? It wasn't that. Right? And, and we just feel like failures. We're just always being beat up in life with not succeeding and not doing what other people have done. But guess what? When my confidence is in Jesus and what he has done, every aspect of my life is changed forevermore. And I can be a confident spouse even when I'm a failure. And I can be a confident parent even when I'm a failure. And I can be a confident employee even when I'm driving Pastor Jerry nuts because I'm found in Jesus. And he defines my life this morning don't place your confidence in things that will fail you because there's always somebody in the foot race that's faster and you will always want to run and cry and stop short. I mean, he didn't even make it halfway, guys. He got passed and quit immediately. But how often in life do we do the same things? Because we're not placing our confidence in the only thing that will last Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for who you are. And God, I pray that we would not place our confidence in our rituals, in our traditions, in our zeal, 
that we would not define how good we are as Jesus followers by how often we go to church, 